The Executive Lounge is empowered by Villa Monticello, Ghana's premium boutique hotel. Villa Monticello, your home of tranquility. Is there something you learned when you were born an entrepreneur? You've got to start small. I have not allowed being a woman to hold me back. Credibility is not just making money, it's about making sure that you know people trust what you're doing. Law practice is not only about going to court, it's about advice. It's very difficult to, to hire somebody who's not motivated and then make them motivated. One of the things that I'm known for is integrity. They have to see you as a person of integrity. It was right. <laughs> Welcome to the Executive Lounge. I'm Inshira Adam. Welcome to the Executive Lounge, the business leadership program that brings you nuggets and insights from men and women who have scaled the daunting height of growing and nurturing businesses across different sectors of our economy. Today we're joined by Ms. Amasapon Bewa, Senior Director, Government Relations, New Mont Africa Region, and a Director on the Board of GCB Bank Limited. She's had immense experience, well over 15 years across both non-government, private sector and government. Welcome to the Executive Lounge. Thank you very much, Ishra. So, we'll talk about your work a little bit, but what was childhood like for you? Um, childhood was fun and carefree. I come from a very large family of brothers and sisters and uh, an intricate network of extended family as well, cousins. Um, aunties, uncles on both sides, you know, of my parents. And um, I grew up in a household that had easily at any given time 14 children. Because wow. my, apart from our siblings, we had cousins who lived with us literally because whenever the holidays came around from secondary school, they would all descend on us from Kumasi, from Accra, from Cape Coast, the different secondary schools. Um, a bit of a tomboy, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> because I, you know, spent time riding bicycles with my brothers, you know, losing a toenail here and there. Um, but um, also a bookworm kept my nose in my books, especially novels, and um, loved reading, uh, you know, as a child. So sort of uh, a little bit of everything. Okay, we that. certainly will be coming back to some of the stuff you've talked about uh, <laughs> to, to explore them further. But would you look back at your own uh, childhood and say maybe there were two or three values that has informed who you've become today? Absolutely. Um, I think first of all, uh, the love for my fellow human being. Um, as I said, I grew up in a large family and so um, compromise team, uh, you know, teamwork, being a team player, um, empathy, uh, compassion. Uh, I think I learned all those, you know, growing up as a child because we watched out for each other. Um, apart from the family, the neighborhood itself was a large extended family. Um, we had several neighborhood kids that we grew up with that we call brothers and sisters to this day that, you know, we are still in touch with. So. Um, another thing that I learned is um, something that was uh, sort of an experience. Um, you know, a neighbor of ours uh, and my mother kind of fell out. You know, uh, sometimes that happens between families. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had uh, a watchman, a security guard, who went for a fruit. I think it was pawpaw from the neighbor's tree. And then as a child, probably seven, eight, I went up to him and said, hey, Papa Watchman, don't you know we are not talking to Mrs. So-and-so and you are eating fruit from her garden? And then this watchman, you know, grown up as he was, went over and told the neighbor that take your fruit back because apparently my madam is not speaking to you. So I think he was interviewed and the neighbor said, who told you that? And he said, well, Mamiyama said so. And so the neighbor sent for me and said, you're a very bad girl. <laughs> when, <laughs> when adults are having, you know, um, I guess interactions or altercations, you don't involve yourself as a kid. And um, he, she asked me first of all, did you say that? And I was stuttering, you know, I, I wanted so badly to say, no, I didn't say that. But the watchman was standing right there and I had said it. 
you know so what one thing that i learned from that experience is that you never say behind somebody what you can't say in front of them mm. and that has been a guiding principle for me so you stood by the things you say and you've been responsible i try to that's I absolutely to nice now there are interesting lessons from this and uh, large families tend to have very interesting stories and moments and lessons from them um what else would you recount from those wonderful long vacations with a house full of uh, young ones? Yeah, um, well, my father was a discipl uh, disciplinarian. And so, um, you know, whenever he left the house for work in the morning, the house would just descend into chaos. <laughs> the table tennis uh, board would come out, you know, um, bicycles would come out, all kinds of things. Friends would descend from all over onto the house. But somehow we always knew, had perfect timing regarding when my father would be coming home. And he would honk twice at the junction before, you know, he got closer to the house. So as soon as it was five, we started keeping an ear out for that, um, you know, honk. And I have never seen things and human beings disappear as fast as we used to disappear at that time. So within record time, the house would be shining, table tennis board, or, uh, you know, it would vanish. You know, bicycles would go into storage. Children that were sweating and dusty would be shining <laughs> because we had dusted off our feet and, you know, combed our hair and were standing to attention. So uh, I guess that also gave me some organizational skills in terms of being able to multitask, being able to also quickly rally and, and, and uh, adapt to situations as and when. Seems uh, you had your own Von Trapp family going. We sure <laughs> did. We sure did. We sure did. Interesting times. Yes. Now, uh, let's fast forward to today. As uh, What does a senior director for government relations do at Newmont Africa or okay. Newmont? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, Newmont uh, in Ghana is uh, responsible for the Africa region. So the Ghana office actually handles the entire Africa region. Mm. Um, government Relations Senior Director, I am in charge of all interactions with all our government stakeholders. So when I say government stakeholders, it uh, ranges from the presidency to the ministerial level, to the agencies, to the uh, regulatory agencies, to um, regional level, to community level. So MC, DC, all of those interactions fall within my remit. So I have um, myself and then I have, we also have people at sites. The, Newmont has two sites here in Ghana, one in the Ahafo region and one in Achim. So we have representatives, government representatives at sites who engage with the DCs and the MCs and the regional representatives at that government level. So. My two ton of work to do. Well, I'm kept busy. Uh, there, there, no two days are the same because, uh, you know, as, as a mining company, we do have um, a lot of interactions with the um, regulators. We try to work as partners with the re uh, regulators because for us, responsible mining, sustainable mining is very, very crucial and part of our core values as a company. And so uh, we consider the regulators and uh, government agencies as our partners. And so we are in constant interaction with, you know. So in these uh, relationships, there are hurdles that you have to get around. And I think one of the biggest hurdles across this continent, whether we like it or not, is getting things done and collaborating with people in a male-dominated environment. Yes. How have you navigated that space? Um, the <laughs> interesting um, that you should uh, bring that up. And I'm always... I mentor a few young ladies, both in my organization and outside my organization. And um, I think, interestingly, um, in Ghanaian culture, we, we, we are um, a lot more relaxed about um, certain things that in other cultures may be frowned upon. Um, some of the interactions between the different uh, genders uh, can sort of sometimes have gray boundaries, not necessarily clearly demarcated boundaries. So um, you, some people may take offense at certain things, others may not. But in other cultures, there is a clear line. You do not cross certain lines, especially in the work environment. Um, but that being said, I mean, in my role, relationships are very important in, in uh, you know, my role as a government uh, relations uh, uh, professional. And so you, you have to learn how to uh, like, like a boxer, how to dodge and parry and, you know, um, um, I, I guess 
uh, situations that, that can potentially be explosive. Mm -hmm. um, so you learn to push back, but in a respectful manner. You learn to push back in a non-confrontational manner, but you, you, you have to be firm. You have to tell, you make sure that people understand where the line is drawn without necessarily aggravating you know, or, or, or damaging or threatening relationships. As a child, you learned how to be responsible quite early. Uh, you also learned how to multitask, which is something I guess you do uh, rely on a lot today. Uh, apart from being a strategic management uh, professional, how will you describe the things you need to rely on in order to be able to achieve what you're doing? If you would look back, not just as a director of the board of GCB, but as a senior director for government relations, and your previous job as head of um, uh, communications and public affairs at Coca-Cola. Um, you know, I always say that gut instinct is number one. Um, we go to school for many, many years to receive formal training. But at the end of the day, common sense, simple human decency and gut instinct should always be your guiding principles. Um, when you treat human beings as equals and, and as you yourself would want to be treated, when you're respectful um, and, and, and I mean always uh, have a nice kind word for someone, a smile, I think it goes a long way in, in opening doors and actually getting people to be receptive to whatever um, discussions or whatever uh, you need from them. So for me, approachability, um, being empathetic, uh, being compassionate, those are the key things that guide me as well as my gut instincts. When I know that it's wrong, I, I, I usually will probe further, use my technical skills, use my professional knowledge, but usually it's right here. Mm. Yeah. So follow your gut instincts. Uh, we're going to take a break in a moment, but before we do that, um, I'd like to explore. You did mention that you have a number of young women that you mentor. Why do you place an importance of, on, on mentorship? Um, you cannot underestimate the value of mentorship. There is so much potential out there that um, needs to be brought out of our young people. So um, apart from young, young men as well, but when you are, I, I guess when you achieve a certain level uh, professionally and, and socially, um, I, I think that it's, uh, the onus is on one to make sure that you're also reaching down and, and, and bringing up young, uh, you know, the younger generation and younger people to also aspire uh, and, and to reach for the stars. And, and, and because our, our, the very um, sustainability and the very, um, our very existence depends on generations behind us. So if we are not bringing out excellence, if we are not coaching them, if we are not mentoring them, uh, experience, I always say that is, is invaluable. You know, you can be the brightest fruit on the tree. You can be the sharpest student in class or, um, you know, the, the sharpest uh, young uh, recruit. But if uh, there are certain things that only come with experience and it's important to share that experience with the younger generation. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, I'd like to explore uh, with you the styles of coaching. Would you say that things have evolved between when you were younger and now that you have to hand off uh, some of the lessons that you've learned. This is the Executive Lounge. We'll be back after these. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me and Shira Addo. Today we're talking to Ama Bewa. She's a Senior Director Government Relations for Newmont Africa Region and also a director of the board of GCB Bank Limited. Before we went, Emma placed a great deal of emphasis on the importance of handing over lessons, experience to the younger generation. She was once young and she talks about how she learned stuff along the way. Emma, how will you describe the difference in the transference of knowledge and experience, i.e. mentoring or coaching, when you were younger, compared to how it's done today? Yeah. Well, when I was younger, I mean, um, compared to today's world where information is at your fingertips, 
where access to anybody is just um, going on some one or other social media platform and finding them and shooting them a message. Um, I would say that the, the, the mentors then and the role models then were farther away, you know, not within arm's reach as uh, mentors and coaches and, and role models are today. So it was more difficult to, to reach out and ask for help from somebody. It was more difficult to have access to people um, at a certain level than it is today. Um, you know, for example, uh, every now and then I get a friend request on LinkedIn. And beyond the friend request, you know, you get uh, a quick message on LinkedIn that says, you know, Madam, I've followed you uh, or I've read about you here. Would you be my mentor? Can I reach out, you know? And I, I have met several young people that way that uh, we've arranged to meet up, we've had chats, and some of them have become uh, quite good friends. Uh, you know, versus when I was younger, you read about somebody in a book and you say, when I grow up, I want to be like that person. So having that personal touch, having that accessibility, having that uh, reach, you know, now versus that um, distance when I was growing up. Mm. I, I think How will you rate difference. the level of accessibility and the abundance of... Um, of, of role models and people, so for example, people are able to reach you very quickly. Would you say that because it's easy for people to reach out, um, the younger generation today are making the most of the opportunities they get from mentorship? Yeah. Well, yes, they are and they are bolder because um, I think that this generation, um, as a result of all the tools at their disposal, uh, have a lot more exposure. They have a lot more global. So it's a global village. Uh, and I know it's a cliche and a word that, a, a phrase that's often used, but um, they have a lot more exposure. Uh, so they are now literally born internationalists versus, you know, uh, a more provincial or a more suburban attitude to life where you are sheltered and where, um, you know, you, you are shy and where you don't have that. Uh, the boldness to, to reach out, you know, to people that you don't know how mm -hmm. much more people, you know, at a certain level of their profession. So um, I think that today's generation, to their advantage, uh, sometimes to their disadvantage as well, has all the tools that enable them to be um, bold, to be, um, you know, aggressive and, and, and to reach out mm -hmm. as they should. The corporate world is a cutthroat space. Um, uh, for the lack of a better expression, I've heard people say it's a doggy dog world. <laughs> um, well, lately there's quite a lot of uh, spotlighting on gender equality and all of that. How have you been able to rise and keep rising in a space like that? Um, tenacity and... Um I, I guess having a thick skin helps, you know, where you are not easily offended. Um, sometimes people have asked me, um, you know, how have you done this or how have you done that? I, I, I basically have said probably, and I am a risk taker. I take risks in my life, you know, personal life. I take risks in business. Um, sometimes I say that you need to be a little bit foolish in order to be... Um, to, to get, you know, to the top in the sense that if you're too wise, if you're too cautious, you end up restraining yourself sometimes. So sometimes you need to be like a child with innocent abandon and just reach out and uh, you will stumble, you will trip, you will fall. But you get up, you dust yourself off and then you keep moving. Um, I think that the greatest uh, motivation for me has, has been my children. I am a single parent of two young adults. My children are 20, my daughter will be 23 in July. Uh, my son will be 21 next month. And I, for me, I had no excuse to sit back and, 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 and sit in a corner or roll over and cry when I, I stumbled or I fell because those two young faces were looking up to me to provide for them. They were looking up to me to set an example for them. So I, I had no excuse and I had no reason no you know not to be out there and to give it my all and to make sure that when i fall i'm right back up you know
You say it so eloquently, but I'm sure there were moments where you really had to look at yourself in the mirror and say, God, am I going to be able to do this? Um, uh, can you recount how you were able to pick yourself up? Uh, I mean, imagine when they were teenagers, you're beginning to deal with, you know, the hormonal changes, the attitudinal changes, and you're probably, you know, mid-level career as well. Demands on both sides of your world. How did you keep your steady focus and just keep going? Um, you know, you always need a champion. And that champion can be a peer, can be a classmate, can be an older person. And um, I always say that I, I never stop learning. And I take every opportunity or every situation as a learning experience. So I had one champion that, um, you know, um, of blessed memory. She was a good friend. We met, we, we both met as young women uh, starting out in, in banking and we became fast friends. And she was my sister and my friend and my mentor and my coach and my champion. So whenever I doubted myself, and we, we were that for each other, whenever I doubted myself, all I needed to do was just bounce it off her and she would tell me that, she, you know, you can make it, you can do it, just keep going. And I think her belief in me um, sort of made me feel like I was a superwoman and that anything was achievable. And um, I, I hope that I, I, I did inspire the same in her because together we moved up the corporate ladder and we left our original organization for different organizations, but we kept that friendship to the point where she was a second mother, literally, to my children, you know. Uh, unfortunately, I lost her um, about four years ago and uh, to, to illness, but she has always been with me spiritually and mentally so that in any situation, I ask myself, what would Linda say? What would she do? Mm -hmm. and, and she's right there encouraging me, telling me, go, girl, you can do it. So th that has also been something. So you found a champion. Yes. And um, that has helped you carry on yes. to this day. But strategic management is, is, is not uh, an easy thing. Sometimes you've got to have to be um, very quick off the bat, on your feet, to get things done, because midstream things are changing. Yeah. And you may not have the, 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 the ability or the luxury of reaching out to someone to bounce things off them. Yeah. How do you manage with things like that? Um, you know, like you said, business is fluid. Situations change, you know, day in, day out, minute by minute, hour by hour. You, you need to have that confidence. And I think that confidence comes with um, knowledge, with, with uh, making sure that you are keeping abreast, with, um, the, you, you know, both knowledge, intellectual knowledge, social knowledge, um, you know, uh, everything. You have to be an all-rounder. And you have to have that confidence to make a decision and be it wrong or right, you stand by your decision, or not stand by, but you own your decision. So even if you make a decision and that decision comes out wrong, you own it. Yes, I made a mistake. Uh, you're open to criticism, you're open to suggestions, you're open to um, other people's inputs. So that when you understand that, um, you know, as they say in Ghanaian language, wisdom does not reside in one person's brain alone. You, you, you have to have input from across. So when you are not sure, you, you check in with counterparts, with colleagues, with, you know, people maybe higher above you, lower, you know, down below you. And, you, you know, you just make sure that whatever you are doing, you're doing it with confidence. And then you also have, uh, um, I, I guess, the wisdom to, to recognize when you're wrong, accept the mistakes and then uh, do it over again. Similar to how prophets uh, tend not to be accepted in their own space, um, it's very easy for nice and wonderful people to not be so nice and wonderful in their own domain. How do you think your colleagues or your team would um, describe you? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I am strict, but... Took after uh, daddy, huh? Well, that and then the Wesley Girls High School training <laughs> as well. So Wesley Girls trains us to be perfectionists. So I, I, I am strict, but I, I, again, that empathy, 
that humanness. And at the end of the day, I, I started it. I, I, I didn't learn it or um, I, I guess it was just maybe intrinsic, but I, I have a certain um, empathy for my fellow human being. And um, to me, you know, much as these hands are not equal, we all will go six feet under, mm. you know, at a point. And so I don't discriminate. My door is always open. When you go to my office right now, I'm sure, yes, I, I, I do have respect for my colleagues because uh, um, when my hair is not dyed, I have a thick patch of gray in there. <laughs> but um, uh, apart from that respect that comes with age, I, I think by treating everybody the way I would want to be treated, I, I guess you, 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 you bring people along and you, you gain the respect of others as well. Mm. So. We're going to take a break in a moment, and uh, when we come back, I'd like to explore where your interests lie outside of the stuff you've done so far. Um, I get a sense of somebody who takes, well, you said it yourself, um, that you are entrepreneurial in a, in a sense, uh, and, and you've not only just had to hold down a corporate job, um, but it would be nice to find out all of that, and we'll do that when we come back from our break. Sounds good. This is the Executive Lounge, and we'll be back after this. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge, and today we're talking to Ama Bewa. She's the Senior Director, Government Relations for Newmont Africa Region, and also a Director on the Board of GCB Bank Limited. So, Ama, I know we're going to talk a little bit about your entrepreneurial interest and all of that, but before then, let's, let's get into the murky world of um, illegal mining, Galamsi, and, and I know your company, and you did say earlier, that you champion uh, sustainable and ethical mining. What's your take on the current situation? Um, you know, it's heartbreaking to see the damage being wrought on the environment by illegal mining. And especially for those of us in the industry who know um, the, the, the danger and the impact of using the wrong methods in mining. Uh, it, it's just um, a scary situation when we see how rampant it is in the country and, and the kind of devastation it's causing. Um, I, I, I belong to a, an, a mining organization uh, called Women in Mining. It's just um, all the women in mining that have come together to form um, sort of a group. And um, women in, some of the women in mining have taken uh, trips into some of these rural areas and engaged with some of these illegal miners to find out what drives them. And um, at the end of the day, it's um, an economic situation, you know, for lack of a better um, livelihood uh, means and, and for lack of, um, you know, job opportunities. But that is no excuse. You know, when you look at the, the natural resources that we have as a country, rainfall is abundant, sunshine is abundant, we have land, you know. And so we, we need to be able to put in place alternative structures that will provide means of livelihood for these people who are engaging in these activities. It breaks my heart when I see a woman with a child on her back, you know, standing in, a, in the middle of a, a mud puddle. Lord only knows what kind of chemicals are in that mud puddle in which that woman and that young child are standing. And so um, the menace of illegal mining needs to be addressed. Like I said, um, companies like the, 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 the um, institutional miners, like Newmonts, like um, the gold fields and the Anglos of this world, I mean, are all now very, very strong on sustainable, responsible and ethical mining. Um, certain um, dangerous chemicals are a no-no. You know, you, you have to make sure that you are partnering with all the um, uh, regulatory bodies like the EPAs, the Minerals Commissions, to make sure that everything that is happening is within regulation. And so illegal mine, I mean, for us as Newmont, even on, on the borders of our concession, every day in, day out, we find illegal miners encroaching and we do our best to remove them you know, responsibly to remove them in a manner that is respectful of their human rights. But we are fighting 
constantly, day in, day out, covering pits that these people dig, you know, and making sure that the land that is allocated to us is not encroached on by these illegal miners because the devastation is just, 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 just uh, incredible. Now, when, the, 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 the whole thing has become such a conundrum that there's a call for an outright ban on small-scale mining as a means to fix this problem. Do you support that? You know, there's a differentiation between small-scale or artisanal mining and illegal mining. There are small-scale miners, you know, like, let's say, an Amabewa Enterprise. I register with the Minerals Commission. I have uh, a license from the EP. I have a small parcel of land. Um, but I can also prospect and mine responsibly within that small parcel. Not use, not use uh, dangerous chemicals, not use banned chemicals. Make sure that I am not disturbing the environment and uh, I am reclaiming, you know, and, and reclamation in the, in the corporate sense. We do a lot of reclamation where lands that, we are, you know, we, 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 we um, impact are returned as close to their normal state as possible once we leave. But on the small scale mining, they can also do some form of reclamation where at least um, their small pits are covered. Um, vegetation is planted on, on, on that pit after it's been covered, after it's been mined. You know, but these illegal miners are digging. I mean, in, in some of our areas, we, you go into some of the communities and people's homes right in the compound. You know how you, they have these compound houses where you have a common compound. Mm -hmm. Right in the compound, there's a little shelter. You know, you see a, a tent erected over a little hole and people are digging below their houses. You wow. know, to, I understand that a, a, a 50 kilo sack of sand can go for as much as 2,000 to 2,500 Ghana cities. Just the sand, you know. So we need as a country to come together to find alternate sources of livelihood for people to desist from. Yeah, I don't think anybody wants to dig a hole under their house knowing that one day they might collapse into, into that hole. I don't think that any woman wants to put herself or her child at risk by standing in waters polluted with chemicals just to make you know, a living. And so um, I think it's important to differentiate between small scale and artisanal mining which is done the right way, which is done the responsible and sustainable way versus illegal mining where you know, unethical um, people are coming in uh, and just digging up the earth, uh, extracting whatever they can from in an irresponsible way, using banned chemicals, poisonous and damaging chemicals, and then leaving the environment after they are done to move on to another spot and repeat that same mm. atrocity. Uh, as uh, Senior Director for Government Relations, you interface with uh, key stakeholders in the policy space. What are you doing? I know some of it is not within your remit uh, because you're an institutional mining company, but this affects the same environment you work in. So mm. what steps are you taking to offer some support to government in that regard? Uh, you know, the industry as a whole has come together under the umbrella of the Ghana Chamber of Mines. I believe a um, couple of days ago, um, my colleague who is the uh, current um, president of the Ghana Chamber of Mines and his team, the chief executive of the Ghana Chamber of Mines and you know, other colleagues from other mining companies went to see the Minister of Environment and we have all offered our support in terms of sitting down and crafting a solution to, to this issue. I know that government is working on regulating the, the, the chief executive of the Minerals Commission and his team at the Minerals Commission, um, as well as uh, the team at the EPA are working on crafting um, there, I think there is regulation for small-scale mining, but crafting even stronger regulation and enforcing those regulations. But uh, beyond that, we at Newmont are actually looking at, um, we, we, we are commissioning studies into this whole menace and, and the whole value chain to understand the reasoning behind it, to understand what we can do to support the communities in which we operate, to, to, to discourage them from going into illegal mining. So we are looking at that. We are looking at uh, alternative livelihood programs, you know, supporting uh, people with uh, alternative livelihood programs, be it um, animal husbandry, uh, be it uh, how to, um, I, I guess, higher yields 
uh, from their farms, mm. you know, and, and stuff like that, so that people are encouraged, you know, to shy away from this atrocity and, and, and find uh, means of livelihood in other um, ventures. I did promise you I was going to delve a little into what makes you uh, the Amabewa we all have come to know of. Um, you seem quite entrepreneurial, something you haven't talked about. Um, are there any other interests that you have outside of the corporate world? Um, yes, yes. Um, I, I like beautiful things and uh, my passion um, is in decorating. So, um, I, you know, a friend of mine uh, recently asked me to redo their home for them. And I, I mean, I was in seventh heaven. I was happily breaking down walls and <laughs> reconstructing and, and changing the layout and, you know, buying furniture and, and, and putting, you know, things together. I, I, I like um, to put things together and, and, and have, you know, a finished look that is beautiful, that is affordable, you know, that is, um, it represents the, the true essence of that person. Sometimes you go into certain homes, very, very polished, you know, very expensive, but it doesn't necessarily gel with the nature of the person, you know. So I think that people's homes, people's environments should be a natural extension of, of their natural selves. And so I enjoy doing things Taking like that. Taking strategic management into decorating, <laughs> huh? Well, um, how will you describe what you do for your pastime um, when you're not busy crafting ideas to engage government or break down houses um i i, I am the quintessential homemaker you know i enjoy being at home i'm a homebody and um i anything that i do around the house i love gardening i garden a lot um, as my neighbor will attest to, I've, I've pulled her into gardening as well. And she sends me pictures of herself, you know, pottering around in her garden. Um, I love swimming. Uh, I'm not an Olympic swimmer by any means, but um, I, I like to get in the pool and swim laps. Uh, it's good for exercise. Um, I spend time with my children. Uh, that's one of my favorite pastimes, actually. Just chilling out with the, the young folks and hanging out with them. Um, chatting, you know, about the world, about ourselves. Um, I enjoy reading. I enjoy watching movies, dramas, especially period dramas. And so I, I enjoy doing a lot of leisure. Let's, let's, well. let's get into your home a little bit. So your children are um, early and almost mid-20s now. So they straddle very interesting times uh, from the 90s right down to the 2010s. Mm -hmm. What would you say has been the evolution in terms of their outlook and the uh, development of their character, especially with the things happening around us? Oh boy, I have, um, my daughter has a very strong independent character. She's about 5'1", five, 5'2", five, very petite, but spitfire. Um, she's musical, she's um, poetic, she's artistic. Uh, my son is about six feet tall, um, you know, he is more of the business guy. He, when he was in school, uh, you know, sometimes he would come home and a, a certain pair of shoes that, you know, did not really fit, that were a little tighter, are no longer there. And where are they? Oh, mommy, my friend liked them, so I sold them to him for, you know, X amount of money. And uh, so he, he's the, the businessman and my daughter is the, the artist. Um, in terms of evolution, I think that um, they, they are both very independent minded and very comfortable dealing with a three year old as well as very comfortable dealing with a 70 year old. And so I, I, I am happy that I have allowed them to, to grow up as individuals to be themselves. And it, it wasn't easy because I tend to be a bit of a control freak. I'm a bit of, a, you know, I have, a, they always call me OCD. I have obsessive compulsive disorder. But, um, it, it, you know, they have sort of yanked me into the, 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 the present and the future where we sit down and we have intellectual discussions. They disagree with me and they tell me to my face. When I'm wrong, they tell me you are wrong. When they don't agree with something, it's like, nah, this one is not happening. 
and you know it's 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 an intellectual discussion so the, we we are friends they are my closest friends mm -hmm. besides being my children wonderful you talk so nicely about the independence of your children but i'm sure there's still quite a bit of you in them in terms of the values they live by yeah. uh, what would you say they are um I, I i in terms of how much of myself i see in my children um i think there's a certain strength of character um, they, they are strong in the face of adversity. I, the three of us have experienced a lot together. I mean, um, I first, um, I went to do my master's in um, 1999, 2000, and I took them both with me. And, um, you know, we have gone from the three of us sharing one bed when they were younger, um, age six and four, to me having to move off of that bed because they were growing up into a couch. Um, you know, I was a student and I was raising two kids at the same time in a foreign country in the US. Um, you know, to a point where, um, you know, today things are, by God's grace, quite good. And so um, I, I have brought them along with me at every step of the way and they've had shared my experiences, both the successes and the failures. And so they do not take things for granted. You know, they are very um, strong-willed and, and, and um, very strong in the face of adversity. You've demonstrated um, a certain conviction uh, for going after the things that you're passionate of, uh, for. Um, but I'm sure somewhere along the line, in those moments where you've had your back against the wall, uh, you've had to think back and say, you know, I wish things were different. Do you have any regrets? Of course, I have, you know, <laughs> quite a few regrets. And uh, unfortunately, life doesn't give you a do-over most of the time. Um, I regret not um, listening to my parents at a certain point in my life. And today, the benefit of hindsight tells me that experience, I mean, you, 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 you cannot best experience. Um, when somebody is telling you something out of wisdom, out of experience, you, you, you need to sit up and listen. Uh, my, my, my parents told me not to do certain things. I went ahead and convinced them because I also had the benefit of having parents who were quite liberal and democratic in their uh, raising of their children. So you so made a pitch. I made a pitch. There you go. <laughs> I, a strong pitch. And they were like, well, if, since you so convincingly sold uh, this proposition will let you go ahead and do them. And um, I must say that it, it, it was quite, um, uh, well, hindsight, uh, a mistake, but a lot of positives have come out of that mistake as well. So. Again, probably because you didn't, you know, take it lying down. You decided that that's the hand you've been dealt. Absolutely. Oh, it, wow. That is the hand I've been dealt. Yeah, I, okay. I like that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for making time for us on the Executive Lounge. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Ishra. As thank always, you for me. great. As always, we end with five lessons from this conversation. Lesson number one. Whatever you say behind people, you must be ready to say it in front of them. Essentially, own the things you say and stand by your own decisions. Because after all, that's what will make you. It builds your integrity. And number two, give back to people. If you learn something, the only way that you continue the process of evolution of society is by sharing the lessons that you've learned with other people. Number three, find a champion. Find that one person who will encourage you. The one who will sit and cry with you when they have to. But over and above everything, will be there with you when times are great and when times are not. Number four, make sure that you live life with careless abandon. Like a child, take risks, make mistakes, but more importantly, learn from those mistakes. And number five, if you're blessed to have children around you, don't impose your own dreams on them. Your mistakes are yours to correct and their lives are ahead of them. But by all means, share the benefit of the lessons you've learned from your own and advise them from your wisdom. Thank you for tuning in. We hope to catch you again on the Executive Lounge. My name is Inshira Addo, and I am grateful to Ama Bewa for joining us and also to Villa Monticello for providing us with the set. We'll be back again. Shalom. Is this something you learned? Were you born an entrepreneur? You've got to start small. I have not allowed 
been a woman to hold me back. Credibility is not just making money, it's about making sure that you know people trust what you're doing. Law practice is not only about going to court, it's about advice. It's very difficult to, to hire somebody who's not motivated and then make them motivated. One of the things that I'm known for is integrity. They have to see you as a person of integrity. It was right. <laughs> Welcome to the Executive Lounge. I'm Inshira Adam. The Executive Lounge is empowered by Villa Monticello, Ghana's premium boutique hotel. Villa Monticello, your home of tranquility.